We're speaking today with Dave Melcher, CEO of ITT Excellus, which spun off from ITT exactly a year ago. About 70% of Excellus's revenues come from defense-related businesses. And so uh, in this world today with sequestration and other issues coming to the fore, um, everyone's wondering what defense companies are going to do uh, in, the, in the new world. Could you tell us a little bit about your company and, and the industry in general? What well, I mean, are. we are a defense and aerospace company, uh, but we also do networking. Uh, and one of the things we've tried to do over the past uh, several years is to diversify a bit away from sole dependence upon the Department of Defense. Uh, and so, as you mentioned, we're 70 percent DOD today and we're 30 percent other. And that other constitutes uh, organizations like the Federal Aviation Administration, NASA, International is now about 10 percent of our revenues and commercial is about three or four percent. Uh, and so we're trying to grow in those latter two arenas, certainly, and we're trying to find some other business, uh, be it governmental or you know uh, otherwise, that allows us to use our technologies in a different way than just solely supporting the department. But DoD is still very important to us. Uh, you know, don't don't m mistake that. Uh, and so we've tried to uh, you know adapt to a thrust on for the Pacific, uh, different priorities and focus areas that'll be needed for the future. The military's gone so high tech in recent years and um, a lot of the discussion around the defense budget has been doing away with some of the bigger platforms which are seen as not as important whereas some of the more electronic capabilities are increasingly important. Could you discuss um, how that shift is happening and um, how your company's positioned for that? Well, I think we're very well positioned for being platform agnostic, you know, is, is probably the way to term it. Um, we build the capabilities that either go on platforms, whether they're new ones like the F-35, or uh, if the decision is made to upgrade F-18s, F-16s, you know, we build a lot of capability that goes on those platforms as well. So, you know, we, we don't rise or fall on any one ship or plane or ground combat vehicle. Uh, in terms of priorities, electronic warfare uh, has been a stated priority for the future. Uh, networking is a stated priority, and of course we have deep capabilities in both of those areas. Uh, and then sensors to decisions. You know, everyone says we have so many sensors today, unmanned aerial vehicles, you know, airborne sensors, shipboard sensors. How do you make sense of all the data that's coming in through all these multiple venues? We have a lot of capability there in integrating big data and, you know, making it more accessible to the users, uh, you know, of, of every service. People talk about big industries like defense. If you try to make changes, it's like turning the Queen Mary or perhaps a, a big battleship is a better metaphor. The whole industry has to shift as the Pentagon's priorities are shifting. Um, how difficult is that going to be for the industry? How much is it going to change? How different will it look five years from now? Well, I think it is going to be uh, a wrenching process uh, for defense and aerospace companies, particularly those that are more pure play, uh, aerospace and defense companies, uh, because the fact is we've been on a, you know, a, a growth pattern for the last 10 years, and these things tend to go in 10-year cycles, 10 years up, 10 years down. Uh, so I think everybody in industry is trying to brace uh, for the proposition that this could be an 8- to 10-year down cycle. So I think getting cost structures, uh, you know, apportioned correctly to the amount of revenues flowing through the businesses, re-examining footprint, you know, looking for ways to, you know, be more uh, economical in delivering those capabilities and services will be extremely important. Affordable capabilities is something that all of our customers are going to need on the DoD side. Were these big tectonic changes in the defense industry um, a big part of the decision for the spinoff of uh, your company from ITT? Well, I think the, the underlying thesis for ITT Corporation was that the sum of the parts, a big defense company, a big water products company, and a big industrial products company, were not being valued, um, you know, proportionate to their, their underlying worth. Uh, and so the theory was that if the company split up, uh, then defense and water and industrial products could be valued more in line with the multiples. Uh, that were accruing to each of those industries. I think the company felt it was a little overweight in defense on the eve of a defense downturn. Uh, so, you know, since we uh, have broken up, I think that theory has basically held true. Each one of the companies has performed fairly well, realizing that the economy is still not, you know, entirely there for the commercial side of the business. And we know we're facing a defense downturn. But, you know, for our uh, stock, for example, we came on the market at 1033. And as of yesterday, we were at 1099. So there's been return to shareholders in that year and we've paid about a four percent dividend on top of that so you know we feel like we've performed in line with expectations and the other two have as well uh, but that was the theory of the case 
When you um, were preparing for the spin-off, uh, what were the biggest challenges that you saw and how did that comport with reality? And also, what were some of the biggest surprises over the first year uh, from the spin-off that, that you found? Well, you know, the preparation for a spinoff is uh, meticulous, it takes about nine to 12 months, depending on, on how hard you're going to charge. You got to get all the SEC approvals. You certainly have to get the IRS approvals. You have to determine how to split up all the assets, if you will, of the company and the liabilities of the company. Uh, you have to have uh, transaction service agreements for IT and for contracting and for shared services. And so we had a very disciplined process to work our way through that over the nine or 10 months uh, prior to the spinoff. Then once we had spun off, of course, we had to build a corporate team, and we worked on that prior to the spinoff. We went from a, about a 60-person uh, group headquarters inside of a larger corporation to about a 125-person corporate team, adding tax and audit and uh, treasury capabilities that were you know, formerly part of our parent. Uh, and so we, we tried to bring in a good, diverse group of people with different backgrounds and experiences, including commercial experience, to try and help us build a team that could be ready for the, you know, for the challenges that await it. For me personally as a CEO, um, the time allocations are very different. Um, dealing with a board probably takes 25 to 30 percent of your time, uh, whereas you were not doing that previously. Uh, dealing with the external community, the analysts community, your investor community, those are all new parts of the picture for a, a CEO of a spinoff company. And then not the least of which is managing the business uh, now with no reliance on other parts of the company. You know, so if it's a tough defense year, perhaps the commercial business is doing well. If it's a good, a tough commercial year, perhaps the defense is doing well. Now we're pretty much, you know, left as a defense and aerospace company uh, that has to, you know, fend for itself in this marketplace. But I think, you know, we're, we're trying to do that very well and manage the challenges uh, that are out there. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that fending for yourself. What's your what's your overarching strategy over the next two to four years, let's say? Well, we intend to be, you know, a very agile defense, aerospace, and networking company that can bring not only high technology solutions but affordable solutions to our customers. And I'm talking customers in the Department of Defense, in the other federal agencies, internationally, and commercial customers. And so we have a very wide portfolio, as you, as you've observed in looking at uh, what we do. A lot of core electronics, air traffic management, we have a uh, air structure composites business, and we have a lot of sensors to decisions capability, including cyber related capabilities. And so what we're trying to do is focus our investments wisely on those things that represent the greatest opportunity for us uh, and managing this portfolio in a, in a smart way to take advantage of the growth platforms that we have, even in a defense downturn. Defense-related companies um, and the Pentagon are probably the biggest targets of attack of cyber warfare. And um, you, therefore, would have to have a lot of experience in protecting your systems and anti-cyber warfare and all the rest of it. Uh, are you now or, or will you be using that capability to advise other firms on how to secure their own networks? Uh, we do, in fact, have a, a very extensive uh, you know, cyber protection capability. We defend our own networks. Uh, and like every other defense company and many commercial companies out there, you know, there have been a lot of attempts to try and extract information from those networks. We think we're very good at doing that. And the reason we have to be good is because we manage the FAA's Air Transportation Network, we manage NASA's Deep Space Network, and the Curiosity Mars Rover um, you know, effort is part of the network that, that we manage. We have to have those networks secure as well. So it's not just about securing our own network, it's about securing the networks of our customers. And so we do think that there's wide applicability for those capabilities that we have. Uh, we are advising a lot of federal customers with respect to that, not so much other commercial companies. Uh, we're not necessarily, you know, in the business of doing, you know, what, what many companies do for commercial businesses. Tell us about the Mars Curiosity Project, uh, what your company does, and uh, any special challenges given that's probably the, the furthest piece of equipment away from you right. that you've ever had to work with. Well, we manage NASA's Deep Space Network, which is a, a series of three gigantic uh, antennas uh, in the Mojave Desert, in Spain and Australia, to try and communicate with all those things, uh, you know, the Voyager, which is way out there now, you know, at the outer limits of the galaxy, the Mars rover, um, you know, you have to have a means of communicating with that capability so that it can do the experiments and send back the information. Uh, we're very proud to have been uh, managing that contract for NASA for the last several years, and so we were out 
out in Pasadena at the Joint Propulsion Lab uh, the evening when the Mars rover landed, and our communications folks were side by side with the NASA people trying to ensure that everything went according to plan and the series of miracles that had to happen for that thing to land uh, keep, you know, on Mars. And we were a part of that, and we're very proud uh, to have made a contribution to this great effort. Um, could you talk a little bit about the specific opportunities you see for taking your technology, which is, as we say, mostly defense related, and applying it to non-defense businesses or niches? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, our commercial business is now today about three or four percent of revenues, but I think we have the potential to the expand that going forward. And here are a couple examples. Uh, air structure composites. We make these parts for the F-35 and for the Sikorsky helicopters that are part of the marine inventory. But we've also done commercial parts for Boeing, and we're looking to expand that with Airbus, Boeing, and other commercial carriers uh, because we have a great facility out in Salt Lake and can expand it. The machines don't care whether it's a commercial or a defense part, and so there's one opportunity. Space payloads. Uh, we've built these for the government and very high-end capabilities, but we've sold a weather payload to Japan, and we're trying to sell imagery payloads uh, in places like the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and then we also have some, some defense technologies that have a commercial application. For example, one is uh, a brain cancer treatment called Novacure. Um, it was an Israeli technology. It's been through FDA trials, but it centers around the piezoelectric discs that are part of a harness that helps to prevent uh, brain uh, glioblastoma, and then lung also. Uh, and so it's because they, they emanate a perfect uh, electric current that was developed for DOD purposes on large-scale sonar arrays, but now applied to a medical technology. We also have a commercial uh, imagery business, uh, you know, and tools to take commercial Im imagery, geolocate it, and make it accessible to businesses that use that kind of information. So I think we really have a number of opportunities in the commercial, uh, you know, market that are close to our core capabilities in defense, uh, and that can be explo exploited as we go forward. For the layperson, would you explain in a little more detail what imaging means in in the way that you're using it? Uh, when I'm talking about imaging, I'm talking about you know capturing images that uh, perhaps are captured by space payloads or unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, and tagging that imagery to you know geolocation on the ground for use. For example, Hurricane Sandy just came through. There are any number of organizations that need to look at patterns of what's happening with flooding as it relates to levees, as it relates to you know other critical infrastructure that's on the ground. We have abilities to take layers and layers of data and make it accessible for use not only by uh, military organizations, for example, in the case of solving improvised explosive device issues, but also available to commercial uh, and federal uh, agencies to use that information for what they need to do on the ground to execute their mission. So it, it's taking all these layers of data and imagery and, and using them in meaningful ways. So this is cameras on satellites, basically. Is yes. that, is that yes. correct? Well, it, it starts there, but it can also be cameras or uh, infrared devices on unmanned aerial vehicles as well. Okay. Are there areas um, that you've developed special expertise in that can apply to uh, commercial areas that that would be interesting to know about? Well, you know, I, I think I mentioned a, a, a couple of them. Um, you know, we're trying to look for opportunities. We've looked at, uh, you know, some energy harvesting solutions. We've looked at some power generating solutions because we have a power solutions business that have commercial applications for first responders and things like that. Um, you know, basically we try and, and orient our businesses to bring forth good ideas like this for potential investment that have wider applicability and potential market applications in commercial as well as military markets. And so we're, we're constantly trying to explore the frontier of what's possible. So those power applications would be what, sort of portable, portable generators? Yeah, or yeah. Uh, portable uh, in, uh, power inverters that could be on vehicles and yield maybe three or four or five times the power that previously could be done by a commercial alternator. Where this is important is in theater, for example, where on vehicles now you have the radios, plus you have uh, geo-positioning equipment, plus you have jammers, and you have other command and control applications, all of which consume great amounts of power for a military application. The same is true now with first responders who have ever more capability that are going on their vehicles. That has to be powered somehow, and so we have a capability to do that that we've developed. Anything more you'd like to tell us about your strategy going forward before we 
we uh, end our discussion. Well, I, I just think, uh, you know, Excellus is a new company. We're one year into our, our new history. Uh, but of course, we come from a 50-year legacy of defense capabilities within ITT Corporation. So it's, it's a new company by name, but an old company by capability. And I think the frontiers that we're trying to explore now, you know, for our Department of Defense, as well as our other customers, and emphasize in those technologies that are really going to be important for the future, like networking, like imagery, like electronic warfare. Those are the kind of things that I'm excited about, and I know our employees are as well. And so uh, we think we have a bright future ahead of us, and we're going to keep uh, working to bring our customers the right things that they need to be successful. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.